Dishonored 2 and Titanfall 2 are both first-person action game sequels, both released within a few weeks of each other in 2016, both are two of my favourite games, and both contain a mission designed around a similar time travel mechanic. This is a comparison of Titanfall 2's mission, Effect and Cause, and Dishonored 2's mission, A Crack in the Slab. Before I look into these two levels specifically, here's a bit of background on Titanfall 2 and Dishonored 2. Titanfall 2 is a futuristic first-person shooter developed by Respawn Entertainment and is a sequel to the 2014 game Titanfall. The game combines Titan and pilot combat, with Titans essentially being walking tanks with a variety of loadouts, weapons and abilities to clear out rooms of enemies, and pilots being vessels for players to make use of the game's advanced movement system to engage in fast-paced gunfights and explore environments. Following the release of Titanfall in 2014, the largest piece of criticism against the game was the lack of a single player campaign. Not only did Respawn go on to deliver a campaign in the sequel, but they delivered arguably one of the best FPS campaigns of all time, and this is largely down to the unique level design in each of the missions. Trooper, take my Titan. Use my helmet in my jump kit. This is the real thing. Take care of him. In Titanfall 2, players are put in the shoes of Jack Cooper, a soldier who's given control of his captain's Titan, BT. Jack and BT set out to uphold the mission of the late captain to rendezvous with a Major Eli Anderson, which leads players to the facility in effect and cause. Upon entering the dilapidated facility, the environment suddenly changes. Requests all teams working on the arc analysis. Gone is the debris and decay as players are teleported into an occupied and operational version of the facility before being thrown back into the facility's overgrown and dilapidated state. What just happened? There are distortions throughout this facility and they appear to be causing a rift in time. Exploring further and killing some of the prowlers that now run the facility, you come across Anderson, but unfortunately he's already dead. BT, I found Anderson. He's a. Uh... In the ceiling. Objective complete. We have rendezvoused with Major Anderson. That's cold, BT. Correct. Anderson's current temperature is 17 degrees Celsius, below the threshold of human survival. You take the data required from Anderson's helmet back to BT, but require his wrist device as well. So you explore more of the facility and experience more shifts through time, this time alerting security robots in the past, making them hostile in the present as well. Finally, you come across the rest of Anderson, as well as his time gauntlet, and with it, the ability to teleport between past and present at will. I'll come back to this device and the mechanics of it later, but for now let's take a look at Dishonored 2. Dishonored 2 is a first-person action-adventure game developed by Arkane Studios, and is a sequel to their 2012 game, Dishonored. The series is centred around player choices and decisions, and the consequences that come from said choices. Players are given the choice of which playstyle to pursue, whether it be lethal or non-lethal, or high chaos or low chaos. Not only are there a variety of weapons, powers and enhancements available to help facilitate these different playstyles, but choices are present within the levels themselves. Levels are built head to toe with different pathways, secret rooms, areas and routes to take to reach the multiple objectives within each mission. There are alternate methods for neutralising each of the game's targets as well, and some only become available to players that are thorough with exploration. The first Dishonored had its fair share of incredible levels, and I'd highly recommend watching the Summer of Mark's video on Lady Boyle's Last Party for a thorough analysis of the design in that level. However, when it comes to Dishonored 2, Arkane really let the creativity loose with levels like the Clockwork Mansion, and the topic of this comparison, a crack in the slab. Dishonored 2 takes place 15 years after the events of Dishonored, and following the death of her mother Lady Jessamine, Empress Emily Caldwin reigns over the city of Dunwall with Culver Atano, the protagonist of the first game, at her side. However, Emily's aunt Delilah arrives to claim the throne for herself. I'm here to relieve you of your crown. Here the choice is given to players of which character to play as, either Culver from the first game or Lady Emily herself. Regardless of the choice, Delilah turns the character not selected to stone as you flee from Dunwall Tower. With the goal of defeating Delilah and retaking the throne, the events of the game bring players to the Dust District in the city of Kanaka, where you help settle a local war between the Howlers and the Overseers over control of the mines ran by Duke Luca Rebel. 
Choosing to help either of these factions leads to gaining access to Aramis Stilton's manor. Players enter the dilapidated and decaying manor to find an insane Aramis Stilton inside, and it's here you're given the timepiece and are prompted to witness what the Duke and Delilah did three years ago in the past. Go and watch the Duke and Delilah. See for yourself what they did. By using the timepiece, you travel back in time to a pristine and well-kept version of Stilton's manor as it existed three years ago. Now that we're caught up with acquiring both the Time Gauntlet and the Timepiece, and can move through time at will, let's take a look at the development of these two levels. The idea for Effect and Cause came to Respawn's senior designer, Jake Keating, by watching a series on the History Channel called Life After People. Its premise depicts what life on Earth would be like without humans, switching between present day cities and the world how it is, to an overgrown, ruined and lifeless version of the same spaces and structures. This not only influenced the idea for the time travel mechanic, but also what the condition and visuals of the level environment would be. The level space itself was a map from the first Titanfall game, but given an overgrown and dilapidated look, with abandoned rooms and roaming prowlers. This is in sharp contrast to the past version of the level, containing a fully operational facility with staff going about their day-to-day -day lives. In a GDC talk from 2018, Game designer Christopher Dion talks about the process of action blocking, which Respawn used to test ideas and mechanics to decide what would and wouldn't work for the missions in Titanfall 2, as well as what was achievable or too ambitious with the development time that they had. This process is what led us to the creation of Titanfall 2's incredible campaign, and standout missions such as Into the Abyss, and the subject of this video, Effect and Cause. The time travel mechanic itself, which was thought by many staff at Respawn to be extremely complicated, involved placing one version of the level and the facility within it, above another version, and teleporting the player between the two, while running both levels simultaneously. Jake Keating had this idea. What if the player could control time travel? So he took this Titanfall 1 map uh, that he had designed for multiplayer, and he made a quick overgrown duplicate of it, so that it looked like it was from a different time. And then he set up some script so that you would teleport between the two locations at the press of a button. After that, he built a path through the environment, using that to explore different gameplay elements with his new ability. People theorized kind of online what, how it's done with texture swapping and stuff like that, but essentially it ended up being um, building one level on top of the other in the same map. Hmm. And you would you would essentially just tell it you'd have a clean version on the top and the dirty version on the bottom. And anytime the player pressed the button or anytime you had these scripted shifts, uh, I'm literally just teleporting the player to the other uh, level. While the mechanic of teleporting players between two levels and two timelines itself wasn't too complicated, it did present many other challenges for respawn, such as how accurate the alignment of geometry and game assets had to be between both levels, and having to manage frame rate and fixing bugs as finding a bug in one level would often mean finding it in the other level as well. Wanting to go bigger and better with the ideas for levels in Dishonored 2, such as the transforming Clockwork Mansion, Arkane wanted another idea or mechanic that would work specifically for one level. Arkane had worked previously on a sequence in Bioshock 2 during the level Outer Persephone, where the player would move through different time zones in a scripted sequence. This became the inspiration for the time travelling mechanic in A Crack in the Slab, only this time Arkane wanted to take the idea further and into a mechanic that players had control over and weren't controlled by. This led to the creation of the Timepiece, a device that provides players with control over time by teleporting them between present and past versions of the same level. Originally, the script for teleporting the player between time zones worked by having the player switch control of a character mesh in one manner to control of another character mesh in the second manner. However, this was streamlined by having just one character mesh teleport between two manners instead, essentially moving the player 1000 units above and below the current location between the two versions of the manner, one representing the past and one representing the present. Like effect and cause for Respawn, the key challenge for Arcane with the development of a crack in the slab was that having two versions of the same manner inside the same level meant that double the assets were used. This was a problem because the level designers were told they would have the resources to make one level, but the concept of a crack in the slab essentially required them to create two. To prevent the loss of frame rate, they also had to strip back the game content, meaning less geometry and fewer NPCs across both time zones. 
I went and created my own time travel level in UE4, similar to Effect and Cause and a crack in the slab, to help demonstrate how the mechanic works. My level starts off in the present, as you find an apartment with a locked door, but by travelling into the future, the apartment has been broken into, and upon entry you find furniture and contents destroyed. Travelling back into the present apartment, it's all intact, and <laughs> that's it. You can see in the level editor this was done by having two versions of the same apartment placed on top of each other, and there's some script in the level blueprint that has the player's character teleport 3000 units on the z-axis by clicking the right mouse button. This is obviously a much more simplified version of what we see in Effect and Cause and a crack in the slab, but you can at least see on a basic level how the mechanic works. If what I've described about the time travel mechanic in Dishonored 2 sounds similar to Titanfall 2, that's because it pretty much is. It's astonishing just how similar the time travel mechanic in both of these games is, and how close the release date of each game was. I've researched what I can, but I can't find any link between the two development teams, or any sharing of ideas for the mechanic at all. It looks like these ideas for time travel were born out of pure creativity from both Respawn and Arcane. In other words, great minds think alike. Let's now look at the different approaches both development teams had with time travel in Effect and Cause and a crack in the slab. The time gauntlet in Effect and Cause seamlessly integrates into the fast-paced combat of Titanfall 2, as players are able to teleport between past and present instantly with no cooldown or resource requirement. The gauntlet itself replaces the tactical ability and allows players to flank enemies by teleporting out of sight and across timelines to a new position and then to re-emerge for the kill. Combined with the already brilliant movement system within Titanfall 2, the gauntlet makes for one of the most engaging and entertaining mechanics in a game that I've played. When moving between present and past, a blue mist is left in the position of enemies in the alternate time zone. This gives an indication of how many enemies remain and where they are before teleporting back to the time zone to fight them. A problem with this approach to identifying threats in the alternate time zone is that the blue mist doesn't indicate to players which way the hostile is facing meaning that you could teleport back only to appear in their line of sight and not behind them. Most of the time however you'll emerge to find hostiles confused and off guard. Both past and present time zones contain different threats for the players to face off against. In the past you have soldiers, robots and titans, while in the present you have robots and prowlers. The interesting thing is that in certain rooms in the facility, enemies will emerge across both time zones simultaneously meaning that you can't teleport into the past for a breather while fighting prowlers in the present, as soldiers will be waiting for you in the past and vice versa. Effect and Cause takes combat to the next level at the end of the mission, where players are able to enter BT and teleport in between timelines and simultaneous gunfights. Another challenge for the designers during these combat sections was balancing the audio whilst teleporting between a time zone with combat and a time zone without. And, uh, and said, okay, well look, when these guys are fighting in the elevator banks, we want to play this one track, but if you shift back and you're fighting the prowlers, we play this one, but if they're dead, you have to play this tail. Unless you go back and you kill all the other guys, and then we're going to play this other track. Yeah. And it was brilliant, and it turned out great, yeah. But uh, and I should have been able to do it the first try, but it took several tries for me to get my brain around it. Yeah. <laughs> in A Crack in the Slab, Arcane had a similar approach to Respawn by having the time travel device replace some of the player's powers. Similar to how the time gauntlet in Effect and Cause replaces the player's tactical ability, players no longer have access to the powers while in possession of the timepiece in A Crack in the Slab. This was done to make the level easier and less complicated to design, as it meant players had fewer options that Arcane had to account for. I think removing powers as an option for players somewhat goes against Arcane's goal of providing players with choices and always saying yes to the players, but I can see why this was done given how complicated a crack in the slab already was, and taking powers away from players also meant there would be more emphasis on using the timepiece instead, as it was only available during this mission. The first idea was that you would remove uh, some of the powers, the mo you know, no, and we, would, we were thinking about just leaving the far reach of the blink so that we because we were afraid that the player suddenly you you remove the mobility uh, uh, power from the from the player and it's it could be you know it could be annoying or frustrating or the player might not like that um, but at the end of the day we you know the more we were trying it the 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 this, this specific gameplay of jumping uh, back in time, and, and it, we realized that it was cool in itself, and we didn't want, I mean, we didn't need to, to add any, any power. 
Although powers were taken away, the decision was made to leave active any enhancements the players had purchased, such as strength, vitality and agility, as well as any bone charms they had equipped. Arcane felt that removing these passive abilities could be a step too punishing for players, after growing used to them and incorporating them into the playstyle. Looking at the enemy threats within a crack in the slab, players will encounter guards in the past, and wild hounds, blood flies and nest keepers in the present. Approaching these threats with the timepiece is useful for both high and low chaos playstyles, as even without powers, players still have the weapons as well as the movement mechanics for reaching hostiles quickly to perform brutal takedowns, and can also use a slower and more stealthy approach to non-lethally take them out and reduce the headcount in patrols and risk of detection. With regards to identifying threats within each of the time zones, Arcane had a much different approach to respawn with the timepiece as it comes with a fan that opens and reveals a window through time and shows exactly what's happening in the opposing time zone. It also indicates to players where they can and can't teleport to due to an overlap in level geometry. This approach comes with its pros and cons. Unlike the time gauntlet in effect and cause, the timepiece shows the periphery of enemies in the opposing time zone meaning it's even easier for players to plan around enemy movement and to position themselves in one time zone to take down any threats that are present in the other. The issue with the window through time is that it really limits what players can see. This was of course done to leave enough room on screen to see through your current time zone, but it's at the detriment of being able to see less in the opposing time zone. Although you can't see the periphery of enemies in the opposing time zone with respawn's blue mist approach in effect and cause, you do have a much wider view of the level space instead and can gain a better idea of how many hostiles there are to plan for before teleporting back. In a crack in the slab however, you only have a narrow line of sight and have to take time methodically searching around areas for nearby hostiles before teleporting between present and past to perform a takedown. Depending on the playstyle chosen, players may have already been methodically taking down enemies one by one in low chaos, so the limitation the window through time has on vision may not be an issue for all players. Use of the time gauntlet in effect and cause shines the most when it's used for exploration and progression, and this is mainly down to the contrasting environments within the present and the past versions of the facility. By using the time gauntlet, players can bypass barriers to progression in one time zone by teleporting into the other. For example, pathways are blocked by doors and lasers in the present, and can be bypassed by teleporting into the present version of the facility where they've already been deactivated and abandoned. Effect and Cause contains several platforming sections that utilise Titanfall 2's advanced movement and mobility mechanics, and the player can dash and wall run while simultaneously teleporting between past and present to avoid environmental hazards and bottomless pits. The Time Gauntlet's ease of use and lack of cooldown were essential for making these sections possible, and led to very fluid and engaging sections to play through. A challenge that Respawn had when it came to creating the platforming sequences was making a believable space. The geometry for one room in particular looked odd and didn't look like it would fit in naturally with the rest of the facility. But after being passed on to the art team, they came up with the idea for the cryo chamber that the area would go on to become. And so yeah, I mean, at one point it was a question of just going to art and saying, hey guys, uh... I've got all these sort of shapes that don't make any sense. The floor has to be lethal in some way. Um, what could we make this into? And just the other day, Todd Sue, our art director, was asking me for screenshots of this very room back when it was case textured, when it was all ugly and gray. Yeah. Because he wanted to use it as an art test for uh, art candidates to say, hey, someday, I'm not saying what day, a designer is going to hand you oh this really goodness. ugly geometry and ask them to make something out of it. <laughs> and make sense of it for everybody. <laughs> and they did. I mean, they made it into this sort of cold storage uh, facility for uh, nefarious experiments. From this, Respawn essentially got the best of both worlds. An area that made sense within the facility environment, and a level space that was fun to play through. Switching back over to a crack in the slab, locked doors in the past have to be avoided by teleporting into the present, and passages in the present are overgrown and blocked off, and have to be overcome by teleporting into the past. There's also a master key that unlocks certain routes in the past that are blocked by debris and boarded up doors in the present. This is similar to the locked doors and lasers that block your path in effect and cause. However, there aren't any complex platforming sections in a crack in the slab like there are in effect and cause, despite the mobility and movement mechanics in the former. But the key difference between Dishonored 2 and Titanfall 2 when it comes to exploration in a crack in the slab is the ability to actually affect the present by changing things in the past. I'm 
And what will change in the present based on what I do here tonight? These time puzzles, let's call them, are each used for progressing through the Stilton Manor or for hunting down items and collectibles. Starting with the time puzzles for progression, the first encounter is with a statue that blocks the path forward in the present, but by going into the past it can be destroyed, which means it isn't around anymore in the present to block your path forward. There's also a partially damaged balcony, and by destroying its supports and weakening it further, it becomes completely collapsed in the present, and provides a ledge to climb up to access the second floor. Moving on to the time puzzles for items and collectibles, this is where things get slightly more complicated. Players will enter a room with a safe inside. The safe is open and empty in the present, and the code on the door is covered in bloodfly mould. By teleporting into the past, it turns out this mould grew from a dead hound that wasn't burned. So by burning it in the past, the mould doesn't grow over the safe door and instead disappears. Now with access to the code on the door in the present, players can teleport back into the past to unlock the safe and loot the contents. There are workers in the past version of the manor that are working on patching up a wall, so by killing them in the past, they never finish the work which leads to the wall disappearing in the present. Players can then access the ledge outside and use it to enter a locked room via the window. There's also a flooded room in the present that can be drained by using a crank wheel found in the past, and you can use levers in the past version of the manor to align the three chandeliers and provide a path into the attic space in the present. Being able to actually change the present version of the manor by changing things in the past adds such an immersive element into a crack in the slab. To its credit, Effect and Cause has similar moments as well, with an audio recording of a lecture that changes depending on whether or not players interrupt the lecture in the past. The militia forces, we will in fact safeguard the existence of the human race, extend by decisively neutralizing the militia forces, we will in fact safeguard the existence of the human race, extending its reach and power towards a prosperous and bright future. Decisively neutralizing the militia forces, we will in fact... Yes, pilot, may I help you? By decisively neutralizing the militia forces, we will in fact save... Yes, pilot, may I help you? And the fact that enemies killed in the past will spawn bodies roughly in the same location in the present. Though this isn't always consistent. Players are told further into effect and cause that their actions in the past have made hostiles and security in the present more aggressive. It appears that whatever actions you took in the past have caused the remaining automated security systems to be quite hostile towards us in the present. But this concludes the extent to which our actions in the past have noticeable consequences in the present. And aside from the audio file of the lecture, the idea of changing the present isn't taken as far as it is in A Crack in the Slab. In fact, A Crack in the Slab goes even further with the impact on the present that changing the past has. The target in A Crack in the Slab is Aramis Stilton, the same one from the past. And whether you decide to kill him, knock him out or ignore him completely, a number of different changes in the present occur. If players decide to leave Stilton alone, the events leading to the present play out the same. He goes to a seance with the Duke Luca Rebel and some other characters to resurrect Delilah, and upon witnessing her return through the void, Stilton loses his mind. Travelling back to the present, the manor remains in the same neglected condition. However, if you decide to kill Stilton, he obviously can't attend the seance and doesn't go insane as a result. So much for all your good intentions, Stilton. There's also some alternate dialogue from Duke Luca Rebel during the seance as he comments on Stilton being missing. It's time to begin. Where's Stilton? I should never have kept him on just because he and my father were close. In the present, the manor is completely transformed. There are no blood flies or damage to the manor, and a note can be found explaining that after the death of Stilton, the manor was bought by Baron Caruso and has since been put for sale. The third option is where things get really interesting. By knocking Stilton out with a stun mine, sleep dart, or by choking him, he doesn't attend the seance or lose his mind. This is to keep you from seeing whatever drove you into a nightmare tonight. In the present, the manor is transformed again, only this time it's in the process of being refurbished with maids, butlers, and workers found in and around the manor grounds. Return to the room where the insane Stilton sat at the piano and players will find the room has completely changed. Keeping Stilton away from Ashworth's ritual changed things. The positive effects caused by knocking Stilton out also affect the dust district that surrounds the Stilton Manor. There's now no Grand Guard to be found, and civilians comment on Stilton being a good man and treating the man as well. Lucia Pastor, a character from the previous mission, also changes location in the dust district, and is revealed to have had a pivotal role in improving the working conditions of the miners. When leaving the dust district, Emily slash Culver comments that people may not have noticed, 
but things have changed for the better as a result of the player's actions carried out in the past. Maybe no one else will even notice. But things have changed here. For the better. These aren't just actions that the players hear about, but actually carried out during the time in a crack in the slab. On top of this, there's one last significant change that can be found. Upon returning to the skiff at the end of the mission, Megan Foster can be found waiting, only now she has both of her eyes and hasn't lost an arm. It's revealed in an audiograph on Border Games Hub, The Dreadful Whale, that Megan went out looking for Stilton the night that he disappeared, and lost an arm and an eye while fighting the Grand Guard. I went looking for him the night he disappeared, but the house was swarming with the Grand Guard. I showed them what I was worth, but it cost me. I'll live to see that score settled. But in this new timeline, Stilton never lost his mind or disappeared, meaning Megan had no reason to go out and look for him, and throughout the rest of the game, her character model is changed permanently. Unless we decide to kill her. Oh my mother. Even with all the details, both small and significant, that change as a result of the player's actions taken in the past, Arcane wanted to go even further. They wanted the entire Dust District to be different when players came back to the present, however this would have only been seen by a small percentage of players who made a specific choice during a crack in the slab, and wouldn't have been worth developing fully for production reasons and constraints. At the beginning it was, we wanted to do something really big. Uh, and of course we could not do this, it was cra too crazy. We tried to contain the changes so that they were not too crazy in terms of production, so we did things that are a bit hidden, but not too much. And uh, most of the effort went into the puzzles that you have to, you know, solve um, to progress. Both Titanfall 2 and Dishonor 2 implemented their time travel mechanics to suit their levels appropriately. With the timepiece and a crack in the slab being slower and more methodical to use, and the time gauntlet in effect and cause being utilised in tandem with the movement mechanics for fast paced combat and engaging platforming sections. However, it's clear that Arcane took the time travel idea further than Respawn did, with the many changes that players can make in the present by carrying out certain actions in the past. This is what raises a crack in the slab just a little bit higher than effect and cause for me. But don't just take my word for it, if you haven't played Titanfall 2 or Dishonored 2, I'd highly encourage you to do so. Not just to experience effect and cause and a crack in the slab, but both games offer such a unique and memorable single player experience, with Dishonored 2's campaign being highly replayable, and Titanfall 2's campaign being packaged with a pretty great multiplayer mode on top. Both games are well worth the current price. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. This has been a comparison of Titanfall 2's effect and cause and Dishonored 2's a crack in the slab. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.